Thank you. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm Richard Pearson. I'm based at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. But as Karen's already pointed out, and you'll be picking up quickly, I'm not actually a native New Yorker. I'm from, uh, from the UK. I was brought up in New York, so in the northeast of the UK. But I've lived for a few years in Oxford, and, and I'm actually now recently moved back to, to, to London. Um, so anyway, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think one of the points I want to emphasize is that we've just heard from everybody about all your wide-ranging interests and expertise. And one thing that we've found in the past with these courses is very much that you're going to learn so much just from each other over coffee, over lunch, over dinner, from nudging the person next to you. So do get into groups. Don't just expect some form of wisdom from, from the front. Um, you, you know, you, we're going to learn an awful lot from you, and you're going to learn an awful lot um, from each other. So let's make this interactive. If, as is likely to be the case, I'm not making sense at some point, stick your hand up and let's have a discussion and make sure we're all on the same page. Um, so I, I'm going to kind of kick off with, with um, a little bit of overlap with what, what Terence just said, but that's kind of by, by design, because we all need to be on the same page to start with. What are we trying to do with these models? What's the kind of concept behind them? It's all very well going ahead and chunk, you know, going churning through the data in the GIS using big databases, remote sensing information, using some really funky machine learning algorithms. We're going to talk about genetic algorithms and macroentropy and some of these kind of cool things. But if we're not on the same page in terms of what the fundamentals are that we're trying to do with the models, what are they good for? What are they not good for? What's the basic theory behind them? So I'm going to just basically spend a few minutes reviewing some of the concepts, some of the basic ecological theory behind what we're trying to do. Um, and you're going to get different perspectives on this. The best that we can do is, is give, we're, we're all fairly, fairly much in agreement, but not fully in agreement on everything in terms of what the models do and what, you know, what's the best way of, of, of presenting it and that. So you're going to get a few different perspectives, but Tam's already emphasised, you know, all we can do is give, do our best to give you our perspective as, as best we can understand things. But we're going to try and during the course of the week, you know, point you to literature with other perspectives and key, key other authors around the world who are, who are going to, um, you know, you're going to learn an awful lot from. So, so I'm going to kick off with conceptual overview of, of what, we're, what we're trying to do here. Um, with these ecological niche. I'm going to stick with the niche because it doesn't have a T in, but <laughs> Tam has made a point that I haven't heard of. I'm going to think of a comeback with the whole Richard thing. But, um, um, so we're talking about ecological niche models. That's how we tend to talk about it. But you'll also see an awful lot in the literature the term species distribution model. Okay? And that's something that's going to create some discussion during the week, and that's uh, widely discussed in the literature. Essentially, they're synonyms insofar as the actual techniques and approaches are largely the same. We're talking species distribution modeling, ecological niche modeling, bioclimate envelope modeling, it tends to refer to just using climate as, as the input variables, but essentially the same kind of approach. Habitat suitability modeling, there are all these techniques that take occurrence data, take environmental data, build some sort of model, and then project those back onto the landscape. But what we want to start from in this next half hour is what does that actually tell us? What does that mean? Um, and I'm just kind of sowing the seed. Start thinking, well, are we trying to model the distribution of the species? A species <coughs> distribution model? Or are we trying to model the ecological niche of the species? An ecological niche model? Am I still in the wrong place? How do I need to be back here or am I okay? It's back a little bit. Sorry. Um, I'll, I'll try to remember that. Okay, so I just want you to be to be thinking about that in terms of what we're really trying to model here, and that's going to be something that's going to key and come up through through the week. And it's yes, it's semantics to a degree in terms of um, species distribution model, or SDM versus ecological niche model, or, uh, uh, ENM. Um, but they're, they're important. It's not just semantics; they're important distinctions in terms of what theoretically we're really trying to model here. And I've actually, I've, I've kind of hedged my bet, I've just noticed on the title side there, I've gone with a niche-based distribution model, that's a bit of a sitting on the fence really, isn't it? Okay. Um, so this is a bit of a simplified version of what, of what Town just, just, just showed you. 
you can add in some more, some more error as well. So let's give you a, a simplified version to really talk through what we're going to focus on during the week. And, and, and really from a practical sense, what these models are. And then, then we'll move on to the, 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 the concepts. We're going to take something about the known distribution of a species. Okay? That's our starting point. And that's what Terence just talked about to the distribution maps and currents records. We're going to take something about what we know about the localities of where the species has been observed. Occasionally, where the species hasn't been observed. Okay? And that's what will, another kind of fundamental point that we'll refer to uh, presence only data versus presence and absence data. We have a focus on presence only data. Okay? And there are some theoretical reasons for that which will hopefully become clear during the week. But there's also a very practical reason. Largely, we only have species presence data. We only have records of where the species occurs. Sometimes, and, and, and there are some very good data sets out there, you'll have species absence records as well. We've been out to a particular point in the landscape, we've measured the species and found that it wasn't there, and we'll tackle that issue as well. But we largely come from a kind of museum community and, and from, 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 from challenges where we only have species occurrence records. So, um, for, but, but essentially for the models, that's our starting point. We know something about the geographic distribution of the species. The other thing that we know, and increasingly we know an awful lot more about as technologies develop, such as remote sensing information, we know an awful lot about the landscape. We know an awful lot about the environment. So we might start with some huge GIS, a geographical information system, a, a, a database of environmental layers. This might tell us things like about temperature, about precipitation, about soil type, um, about like, variables like NDVI that we get from remote sensing elevation, slope, aspect, um, you name it, a, a number of, a whole suite of different environmental variables, they tend to be raster layers, so, so geographic space that's divided in, into pixels, um, uh, so, so, so we know something about the species distribution, and we know something about the environment. There's a step here that I like to emphasize, which is to say we might, we might start with a big database of geographical inf information, but we might do some, some kind of pre-processing to generate environmental layers or environmental variables that we think tell us something important about the distribution of species. So these would be variables that actually we think have some sort of direct physiological role in influencing the distribution of the species. So instead of just talking about, say, monthly values of precipitation or soil type, we might actually be, um, uh, generate variables based, based on this GIS database that might be things like the maximum daily temperature. Well, if you're interested in a, a, a lot of species, that's a variable that's going to be potentially very important. Or we might be interested in the number of frost days during the year. Again, there's a variable that could have a direct physiological role if you're interested in our agricultural plants or if you're interested in plants. Any, any, any number of organisms respond to frost days or a soil water balance. So we might not just be interested in, in what the soil type is, you know, we've got a certain podsol or cambisol or something like that. What we're really interested in is the water holding capacity in the soil. If you're interested in plants, for example, that's the variable that's important. So what you're often be thinking is not just what data can I get hold of, but what can I do with that data to generate some variables that are going to be important for defining the distribution of the species. So essentially, we're going to talk through distribution data and environmental data, and that's largely what we're going to cover, I think, today. They're the data that go into the models. Then we're going to use some sort of algorithm. We're going to use some sort of algorithm to build an association between the two. And we're going to talk about methods like max, max N, artificial neural networks, generalized linear models, boosted regression trees, GARP, genetic algorithms. There are any number of approaches, okay, and that's when we get into the technicalities, we're going to talk through those, but essentially, they're all doing this job of building some sort of association, in fact, a statistical association that defines the environments within which the species occur. So we're building some sort of, we often refer to it as a correlation or an association between the environment and the species occurrences. And then, as Tanner's just just talked about we're going to do some sort of kind of model calibration. Okay, so we're going to um, do some sort of processing of selecting suitable variables, some suitable parameters, um, 
Uh, we're going to do things like which are the most important variables. Um, and, and some of this we're going to talk through is just generic because all these different methods have different parameters, have different ways of viewing the world. They're in many ways, very, very different perspectives on how to build this association. We're going to give you just really a couple of practical ways that you can do this so that to make sure that you go away from this week actually being able to build the models. But a lot of what we're going to kind of try and talk through is, is a bit more generic in terms of um, just, you know, what, what are the kind of tools that we would use? What are the kind of techniques that we would use to do things like selecting important variables, selecting important parameters? But this is a really key step, and I think that's really a, a focus of, of tomorrow in terms of how we actually can calibrate some models. Then what we do, we build that association, and we, in fact, we, we project that back on in, onto environmental space. So we project that back and draw a map. Okay, so we go from ecological space, that I'll talk about in a minute, back to geographical space. Then, as Pell has emphasized, before we do anything more, we want to say, well, is that model any good? Don't, do we have some sort of predictive ability here, some sort of predictive performance? And you'll often hear that referred to as, as, as model validation or model evaluation. Um, so we're going to talk about that, I think, on Wednesday in terms of ways that we can do that, things like data splitting, and statistical tests that we can use, area under the receiver operating characteristic curve, or binomial tests of, of predictive performance to get significance tests, things like that. They're essential tests if, you, if you're putting this work in a thesis, in a government report, in a publication. Anytime you're applying any of these models, you've got to have some of the tests of is the model performance any good. And what we're going to what you're going to see is that this is this is one of the, the, the really difficult areas in terms of how can we really evaluate model performance. And I think it's fair to say it's one of the most active areas of, of research because it comes back to a lot of the theories that we're going to talk about. Well, what are we actually trying to predict? If we don't really know if we're trying to predict the distribution or the niche, then how can we then evaluate how good the model performance is? So we've got to have our theory straight before we can start doing good evaluation. Again, just seeding things that, that we're going to come back to and we're going to talk about in a lot more um, detail. So we evaluate the model, and then really that's when we can start doing the cool, interesting stuff. Okay? That's when we can start predicting, say, invasive species. We can start predicting under climate change scenarios. We can start asking questions about niche, uh, whether niches e evolve over evolutionary timescales to start asking questions about things like speciation processes. We can use the models to start guiding field surveys, all these kind of applications that we're going to talk about. And that's really, to, to, to caricature it, if you like, that's going to be the focus of, of Thursday. We're going to move on to applications. So I think that's our kind of progression through the week. We're going to talk about some theory this morning, some data this afternoon, tomorrow about the actual nitty gritty of the models and model calibration. Wednesday, we're going to talk model evaluation, this kind of step here, and then we're going to get onto the fun stuff in terms of the actual applications. As I say, that's a caricature, it's not going to be so straightforward as that, because that, that might be a bit just too linear, but that's the, that's the concept behind what, what we're trying to do. There's another box here, which really relates to this predictive performance that, that we'll come back to, but that's another way of evaluating models. Instead of just testing how well the model can recreate the, the existing data that we have, this is where we actually try and test whether the model is useful for the particular application that we're interested in. So this might be where we evaluate, well, can the model actually predict invasions into a new region? Can the model actually predict, predict distributions under a different climate scenario, going back in the past or going forward in the future? Okay? One really key... Um, point that I just want to, we really want to emphasize early on, excuse me, and, and, and Tam has already touched on this, there are two fundamentally different ways, two different approaches that can be taken to address this question of characterizing the ecological niches, excuse me, 